Welcome everybody to the Bicycle Day launch. Happy Bicycle Day. I don't know how many of you cycled here today. Anyone? No? Oh, we've got one. Good on you. <laughs> I'm glad you're sat at the front. Um, I should also say welcome to Breaking Convention, everybody. There's been an incredible amount of work has gone into it, and we're about to see a very smooth and beautiful conference with some fantastic people talking about some brilliant things, lots of mischief, mayhem, and fun as well. Now, we're, today we're going to be talking about Bicycle Day and other psychedelic essays, the new book by this gentleman, Alan Piper, over here. Thank you, Rob. Alan has been uh, plumbing away at the depths of drug history, social and cultural in the early 20th century for many years. Uh, and he's had essays in various academic journals and the Psychedelic Press Journal, of which I'm here representing today, uh, and various other places. Um, and he got in contact a few years ago saying, well, I've written an extended piece on Bicycle Day. Now, as someone who's read an awful lot of psychedelic books myself, my heart sank a little bit, because you read the Bicycle Day story in absolutely everything you read from academic journals to blog posts. But I dutifully read his wonderful essay, which was a very deep and wonderful dive into the social, cultural, and even occult background of some of the happenings around Albert Hoffman's brilliant discovery 80 years ago today. So, without further ado, Alan's going to give a little talk on that essay, and I will hand over to him. Then afterwards, we're going to do a few questions. Um, and we've also got copies of the book over here, and you're welcome to come down and buy one. We've got a card reader, so we can do all the modern stuff. Um, <laughs> So I will hand over to Alan, if you'd like to give him a round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. So Bicycle Day, an alternative view, grounding Bicycle Day in social and political realities. Um, the fact of the matter is I doubt many would disagree that Bicycle Day, the events of Bicycle Day, are really highly romanticised. And this is a kind of look about, <clears throat> look at... Um, what other things were happening and events and personalities and so on around uh, the event of Bicycle Day. So, yes, my lovely new book. Thanks so much to Psychedelic Press. done a wonderful job on this. Um, I will be talking today essentially about this essay, Bicycle Day and Ritual Myth and History. Ritual being the celebration, I guess, of Bicycle Day, uh, the iconography of uh, Hoffman and Bicycle Day itself. Um, myth being some of the sort of stories, the strange stories, conspiracy theories and such like um, around Bicycle Day and, and some historical um, issues um, relating to Sandoz and, um, and such like and the background to, to Hoffman himself. Um, it's not the only essay in there, there are other essays, um, a lot of them are kind of literary in nature, um, looking at psychedelics as they appear, sometimes veiled in uh, novels of 1920s, 30s, and, and lastly, uh, Ernst Junger's um, visit to Godenholm. Let's get on with things. So Bicycle Day, yes, we established, if you didn't know, by Professor Tom Roberts. Um, and there's a, a charming little explanation of why Bicycle Day is the 19th and not the 16th of April. Um, but um, many may not even know that Tom Roberts was the person who instituted Bicycle Day. So begin at the beginning, Albert Hoffman's bicycle. So where is Albert Hoffman's bicycle? Um, we don't know. Actually, Albert was asked, whatever happened to that bicycle? And he said, I junked that years ago, which is a bit of a shame. We'll come back to that in a moment. I'd like to think it was one of these. This is a Swiss Army issue, 1943, M005, Army issue bicycle named suitably the Cosmos. Now, it might have been a Cosmos, because Albert Hoffman was in the, uh, the Swiss Army Reserve. <clears throat> As you may know, he talks about it in his autobiography. If it came up to auction at Christie's and someone did locate it, uh, I can only imagine what actually it would be, be sold for. So, Basel 1943, two blue arrows at the top, that's the Sandoz um, factory just next to the Rhine, and there at the bottom is Hoffman's residence at that time in Bottmingen, just outside of Basel. Taking a slightly closer look, Novartis, currently Sendor's exists as part of Novartis, <clears throat> 
Lichterstrasse. Again, unfortunately, nothing to do with uh, LSD, Light Street. Um, if we take a look up here um, and look at the various streets, there's Lichtstrasse. And next to it, you have Farbstrasse, um, dye or colour street, because Stendors was originally a dye and um, paint uh, manufacturer. Um, and also you've got here um, Volterstrasse, and uh, somewhere along here we've got Wasserstrasse and Wattstrasse, Gasserstrasse. This is where the utilities were for the good people of Basel. And Sandoz's um, factory was originally established there just next to the Rhine. So there's the Sandoz paint factory. And um, Arthur Stoll was engaged, uh, I think it was 1919, to institute a pharmaceutical section for Sandoz. Originally, as I said, a manufacturer of paints and dyes, which was um, um, well established in Basel. A lot of textile manufacturing and the manufacturing of paints and dyes. So they moved on from that when they uh, employed um, um, Stoll to institute a pharmaceutical section, and he started investigating almost immediately ergot. So there's just a look at some of the sorts of things you'll find online, various literature um, demonstrating what was available from Sandoz, often in multiple languages with an international company selling paint and dyes. Sandoz 1929, I think in about here, is the uh, Sandoz factory, still next to the Rhine. And there in 1961, considerably more developed. Um, just down here, you can see the railway line here. In fact, that's, this here is France, and that's Switzerland. That's the border of France and Switzerland. I think Albert Hoffman indicates somewhere that from his window he could see into, into France. So the modern route, if you wanted to follow Albert's route, um, and go to Basel, which I'd like to do myself one day. Um, if you go onto this website here, bikemap.net, a friend of mine, Sandra Lang um, of Zurich, has posted this there, offering uh, something as close as you can get to following Albert's original route, if you'd like to do that by way of celebration. So Albert Hoffman Rhein, there is a small um, memorial to Albert's ride, um, close to his home in Botmingen, there's a sign. I'll read it for you in translation. Swiss chemist and a discoverer of LSD lived and researched from 41 to 68 in Botmingen, over Willerstrasse 41, where he discovered the hallucinogenic effect of LSD as part of a self experiment. And that's my thanks to Sandra Lang of, of Zurich, who took this photograph for me. You'll find quite a few photographs of this online. And as you can see, there's a fair little bit of graffiti. Uh, as one might expect on this post. It's actually, rain means something like side. Really, it's a rather sad looking little alleyway um, which uh, commemorates um, uh, the arrival point essentially of, um, of Albert Hoffman. So an alternative 19th April 1943, which is kind of what I promised you, um, altered alternate images. Here's Blind Bomber's delightful little graphic novel um, celebrating Bicycle Day. But curiously, there's another April 19th, 1943 graphic novel, which is this one. Yossel, April 19th, 1943 by Joe Kubert. Now, while Blomer's Bicycle Day celebrates Albert Hoffman's um, ride, his Bicycle Day ride, um, it has a kind of almost fairy tale quality to it part of the kind of romantic view of Bicycle Day itself. And um, the graphics follow um, the kind of psychedelic art of the 1960s. Peter Max, for example, or Hans Edelman, who did the artworks for the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. So Yossel, April 19, 1943, what is that about? Well, that's about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that occurred also on April 14th, 1943. So the Nazis had arrived um, expecting to um, deport the Jewish inhabitants of the Warsaw Ghetto. That's to say part of Warsaw had been walled off, bricked off, and the entire Jewish population of Warsaw and the surrounding areas had been confined in there where many of them starved to death. Little did they know, in fact, that the had formed resistance groups and struggled, smuggled in weapons. Um, and they were met with machine gun fire and petrol, petrol bombs. Um, so Joe Kubert's graphic novel 
imagines if his parents had not come from Poland uh, to America and escaped the Holocaust, what his experiences might have been like as a young man, as he would have been in um, the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943. So there we have the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943. The Jewish inhabitants have been marched out of um, the ghetto by the Nazis. This photograph selected by Time magazine as one of its of the one most hundred most influential photographic images of all time. Um, something it has in common with the image that many will be familiar with of, uh, of a young Vietnamese girl running down the road having um, been wounded by friendly fire napalm bombs in Vietnam. So Jürgen Stroop um, was the officer who once uh, they realized that the Jewish inhabitants of the ghetto were not going to go easily, was a man who was called in to clear the ghetto. And it took them about a month to clear the ghetto. And they imagined that the inhabitants of the ghetto would come peacefully and get onto the cattle trucks and be taken off to concentration camps for the purpose of extermination. And what you might say, what is the possible relevance of this to the discovery of, of LSD? Well, in a survey view at adults aged 13, 18 to 39, 23% said they believed the Holocaust was a myth, had been exaggerated or weren't sure. 12% said they'd definitely not heard or didn't think they'd heard about the Holocaust. So my point here, I guess, is that some individuals uh, in America may well be celebrating Bicycle Day um, and aware of the events in Basel that took place on the 19th of April, 1943, but be entirely ignorant of the events that took place in Warsaw. So moving on a little bit, the wartime operations of Sandoz. Now, when I first became interested in the history of Sandoz and the history of LSD and started digging a little deeper than probably most, um, the period 1939 to 45 <clears throat> on, um, on the Novartis website was just blank. There was nothing on the website at all for that period, which is not the case now, but I'm not entirely sure what is there. Um, however, to look at this issue, uh, the Berger Commission, Commission, otherwise known as the Independent Commission of Experts, was set up in Switzerland in 1996 by the Swiss Federal Assembly to research into the quantity of assets imported into Switzerland before, during and after World War II. Basically, how did Switzerland and Swiss companies profit from the war? Information from Nazi Germany, this is quoting from that, um, that commission's summaries, was sufficient, even comprehensive, and flowed without interruption. And in 1942, Sandoz was fully informed about the euthanasia program, that is to say, the murder of handicapped people um, by the Nazis. Sandoz maintained factories in Munich and Nuremberg during the Nazi period, 1939 to 45, which probably not many people will be aware. They maintained their operations within Nazi Germany and uh, alongside the Wehrmacht, SS medical units also bought Sieber, Roche, other Swiss companies, and Sandoz Medicines. Um, Sandoz cooperated with the aryanization of foreign companies in Nazi Germany by removing Jewish staff. Arthur Stoll, who was um, employed by Sandoz to set up the pharmaceutical section, um, his mentor, Richard, Richard Wilstatter, was removed from the board. He was actually chairman of the board of Sandoz Nuremberg's uh, manufacturing unit. Phil Seattle was a Nobel Prize winning um, organic chemist um, and Arthur Stoll's mentor. Arthur Stoll studies his, um, his doctorate under, under Vilstatt. We'll come back to Vilstatt a little bit later. Uh, in recognition of their complicity with Nazi resume, Novartis later made a solidarity contribution of 25 million Swiss francs to the settlement of claims from the Second World War. And they made another contribution there to a German business and Austrian reconciliation fund. Now, curiously, Sandoz were, might have been, might be seen as having actually supported the Nazi war effort in that um, some of the medicines prescribed for Adolf Hitler by his personal doctor, Dr. Morell, during the period 91, 1941 to 45, were actually Sandoz manufactured in this case, you can see it in Nuremberg. 
another of those um, medicines prescribed for him, again, Octalidon, another Sandoz Nuremberg product. So moving on from that, slightly perhaps disparaging, but to me interesting aspect of um, the history of, of Sandoz, standing on the shoulders of giants, um, Albert Hoffman, as heir to a, a phytopharmaceutical dynasty. Um, I call it a line of pedagogical succession. Um, Hoffman doesn't refer a great deal to the history of organic chemistry and how he, his own um, work developed out of that. Um, but if you go back to the, the early 20s, well, let's look first at Arthur Stoll, just to remind people who he is. 1917, appointed professor of chemistry at the University of Munich. And that year, he's hired to head the pharmaceutical department of Sandoz. And he immediately commenced work on ergot. So we have to understand no stall, no LSD, really, because you know, perhaps somebody might also have investigated uh, the medicinal properties of, uh, of ergot. But it was Stoll who implemented it in the first place. Listen, in 1929, he appoints Albert Hoffman as an employee of the pharmaceutical department of Sandoz Laboratories. But taking a step much further back, Alfred von Bayer, 1835 1917, Nobel Prize winner uh, for his work on organic dyes and hydroaromatic compounds. So we see here still this trace of um, dyes and paints um, and plant pigments. And uh, he achieved the synthesis of the plant dye indigo, a very important issue in terms of um, dyes and paints. Oh, and he also achieved the synthesis of cocaine. Um, Einhorn studied under Bayer, 1856-1917, uh, and achieved the synthesis of local anesthetic procaine or novocaine, something which probably many of us have profited from when we've been at the dentist. Um, and also the synthesis of mentone. So Ville Stata studied under Einhorn. He wanted to study under Bayer, but Bayer was too busy um, for him to study under. He studied under Einhorn, and his doctoral thesis was on the structure of cocaine. He won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1915 for his researches on plant pigments, especially chlorophyll. Now, he resigned from his, from his university position as a professor uh, in Germany to protest against anti-Semitism uh, in academic appointments. Basically, he felt that people of a Jewish ancestry were not being appointed um, when they should have been and other people were being appointed in their place, which led to something called the Vilsata controversy, um, where the relatives and friends of um, those, I guess, that he had targeted as being not the best person to be appointed, um, challenged Vilsata and felt that he had exaggerated the issue. Um, and he, in fact, accepted at Storm's request the chairmanship of the board of Sandoz Nuremberg in the first place, but stepped down, as I explained earlier, <coughs> due to the Aryanization of Sandoz. Uh, in, to Germany in 1933. Uh, eventually he escaped to Switzerland with the help of Stoll, but it, it, it damaged their friendship um, permanently. So it, it was Stoll who really persuaded Wilsnatter to step down. Um, and in letters, uh, the, the letters are in my um, essay, or the reference points for the letters are in my essay. Um, Wilsnatter made it clear that he, it was a political issue um, that forced him out of office as chairman of the board. So now Arthur Stoll, he worked and studied under Wilstatter and famous for his work on chlorophyll, cardiac glycoside, senna, garlic, and as we all know, ergot. Um, clearly Arthur Stoll was a great admirer of Wilstatter. Hoffman complains in my problem child, Stoll, he's always going on about Wilstatter, Wilstatter, Wilstatter. Um, But he was a Nobel Prize winner and clearly a huge influence on Stoll. Albert Hoffman worked under Stoll at Sandoz, famous for the synthesis of LSD-25 and for the discovery of the psychoactive properties of LSD in 1943, and also for the identification and synthesis of psilocybin. Um, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, Hoffman does mention a little bit his sort of kind of academic heritage um, my doctoral work under Paul Carrow gave me 
a chance to pursue my interest in plant and animal chemistry, but he doesn't refer a great deal um, beyond that. So Carrer's most important work, again, we're looking at plant pigments, and he again, he was a Nobel Prize winner. So moving on to a different topic altogether, LSD is the creation of an arcane order, conspiracy theories, and the creation of LSD. The Harmon story, the Willis Harmon story. Willis Harmon, in a 1977 radio interview, um, had this to say. The LSD story really starts way back in 1935 with a group of followers of the German mystic Rudolf Steiner. In 1935, a dark cloud was over Europe, so the members of this group set out deliberately to synthesize chemicals which were like the natural vegetable substances used in all the world's major religious traditions down through the centuries. By 1938, they synthesized psilocybin, LSD, and about 30 other drugs, which they certainly hadn't. Five years later, in 1943, they decided, apparently, that possible negative consequences of sharing them, as to say, these drugs that they had synthesized, of sharing them with the world were nothing compared to the consequences of not doing this. One of them was the chemist Dr. Albert Hoffman. He cooked up the newspaper story about the accidental ingestion of LSD and the realization of what its properties were after an amazing bicycle ride home. So who was this Willis Harmon with his strange story about the invention of LSD or the de deliberate synthesis of it uh, in order to, to save the world uh, in a state of destruction? Well, he was an educator with a PhD in electronic engineering who taught at Stanford University. Uh, and he had links, close links, to the West Coast elite psychedelic circles of Gerald Hurd, Aldous Huxley, and the notorious captain Alfred M. Hubbard, otherwise known as the, the Johnny Appleseed of LSD. Um, so that's, that's Harmon's story. An individual called Mark Stallman, who's a kind of um, c contemporary um, pundit of digital media, um, starting around 2010, he posted a secret history of LSD, <coughs> which referred to Willis Harmon's interview, and claimed that Ergot was a secret sacrament of Eleusis and handed down through the ages through secret societies. Later, I discovered this 1933 novel by Leo Perutz. And if you've never heard of this novel, um, it's well worth seeking out. St. Peter's Snow, which is meant to be a folk name for Ergot. Um, and in 2013, I published a paper discussing it, which is available online. So in this novel, published in 1933, mind you, sort of 10 years before the um, first synthesis of LSD, oh, that's the original copy from 1933. Uh, and it describes how a German baron had discovered that Ergot was the secret society of the ancient mystery religions. How he derived the psychoactive drug for ergot. He employs a Greek biochemist to synthesize a drug from ergot uh, with the intention of reviving the Holy Roman Empire. And he has some um, secret um, bloodline, a figure from a supposedly secret bloodline, which he hopes to get in place in his uh, revived Holy Roman Empire. And he experimentally doses the local peasantry, invites them all to a knees up, free beer and cakes, um, and secretly doses them, um, but it actually, instead of leading to um, a religious revival, it results in a communist uprising in which he is killed. So here's a couple of editions, paperback editions, a German one, St. Peter Snow, this one obviously um, reflecting the Baron's desire to revive the Holy Roman Empire. And this one here is actually a, a Turkish edition, Leo Pritz, Saitan Tozu, which means the devil's powder. Um, but Peruzzi's story has, has reached um, um, into as far as Turkey. So what might be behind these strange ideas, um, other than speculation? Um, you can follow Mark Stallman's ideas online if you seek them out. Um, but this section is called Arthur Stoll and Albert Hoffman's Esoteric Connections which may lay behind some of these conspiracy theories. But there still remains um, St. Peter's Snow, 
um, to be explained. Um, so Stoll, Arthur Stoll, I never found this anywhere else until I started digging myself, was actually a close friend of Hermann Hesse. Um, of course, Hesse's novels are based around um, experiences of enlightenment, transfiguration, and so on. Um, Stoll's large collection of artworks by Hess, correspondence, special editions of his books, and such like are held in the Swiss, Swiss National Archives. And um, Hess exchanged special editions and artworks with Stoll for the latest Sandor's drug developments um, with which Hess experimented. Um, not as far as I'm aware, um, LSD. But obviously people have speculated um, um, because of the narrative of Steppenwolf that Hess may have had experience of, of mescaline. There's a couple of the, the letters, the illustrated letters, which, um, which Hess sent to Stoll. You can see there, dear Professor Stoll. I think the other one actually is to Frau Professor Stoll to Stoll's um, wife, but they were close, close friends, um, Stoll and, and his wife. So Hess's novels, as many of us are aware, um, were adopted by the psychedelic, so by the psychedelic um, culture of the 1960s and 70s. And several of his novels follow the Bundesroman pattern in which Bund meaning a, a fellowship or a league or a society, like a secret society, uh, in which an individual is initiated into esoteric wisdom by a kind of magus figure um, or a secret society. And there's Timothy Leary to forward to Hesse's Journey to the East, that edition, that paperback edition there. Um, and this was his conviction. There seems to be little doubt beneath the surface of Journey to the East runs the history of a real life psychedelic brotherhood. Citing a biography that traces the connections between the names of participants in the League and locations and Hesse's friends' activities at the time. So he thinks it's an actual kind of semi autobiographical account by, by Hess. Um, here's a penguin edition of Steppenwolf, has a um, painting by Paul Klee. Um, and Paul Klee was one of the people adopted by Herman Hesse as a member of his league in Journey to the East. Um, this sort of secret society or invisible college, which features in Journey to the East. And um, he's adopted various living figures, such as Paul Klee, figures from literature, um, um, history and real life, such as, uh, as Klee. Curiously enough, Klee did actually, for those who know something of the novel Steppenwolf uh, and the Magic Theatre, uh, he did uh, complete a work between 23 and 25 called Zauber Theatre, um, Magic Theatre, which might have made a better cover to the Penguin edition of Steppenwolf. Um, so as I was saying, the sequence in Steppenwolf, which Pablo introduces a group to the experience of his magic theater under the influence of yellow cigarettes and an aromatic liquid produced from an oriental box, uh, has been taken to indicate Hess's interest in psychoactive drugs. So Hess and psychedelia has become a kind of lasting association. Here's a Deutsche Grammophon um, reading of um, Steppenwolf with Hess seemingly it looks as if he's just um, smoking some DMT. So Arthur Stoll's dark collection, Stoll was a great collector of art. Um, in addition to works by foreign and many Swiss, manu uh, Swiss masters, the collection centers around magnificent works by Hodler from each of the, his active periods. Um, this is from his obituary um, from the Royal, by the Royal Society. He was, a, he was a member, was inducted into the Royal Society as the cover of the um, collected works. Saul's favourite artist Hodler was a friend of Dal Crowes. I'll explain who Dal Crowes is in a moment. Um, but Hodler originally exhibited it by invitation at the Salon de la Rose Croix, the sort of esoteric art exhibition by Sar Peladon. Um, and his latest symbol and influence paintings include scenes with a kind of ritualistic atmosphere. Um, women are dressed in the Grecian style adopted by modern dance movements, uh, associated with the works of Dal Crowes and Rudolf Laban. Um, who were based, or for a period of time at least, at the, uh, the artist colleague Monteverita, um, which you might have heard of, which was a kind of bohemian commune, basically, um, where they like people enjoyed dancing um, and uh, indulging in nude sunbathing and vegetarian 
food and such like. Um, and it was frequented by, amongst other people, Herman Hess. So there's just a picture of um, Dal Crows. He was a composer, um, and Laban was a kind of the theorists of, of modern dance. So moving on from Stoll, Albert Hoffman's occultic circle, um, Professor Carl Bayer um, gave a lecture um, in 2019 at the University of Amsterdam called Early Psychonauts, Albert Hoffman's Occultic Network. Uh, and what was that about? Well, gathered around Hoffman was an informal group of friends and associates who experimented with psychedelics. Professor Carl Bayer coined the term occultic to describe this network, um, meaning something uh, between those who identified as members of an actual occult order or tradition and the popular culture of occultism. The two active periods of experimentation by this group, um, with experimentation with psychedelic drugs in groups or pairs or individually, the first between 1949 and 51 was with LSD and mescaline, the second between 60 and 70 when psilocybin was added to their armory. So at least in relation to the early period, there were groups of people experimenting with um, psychedelic drugs in, in, in a kind of mystical, I suppose, um, or occult kind of context, um, well before the psychedelic 60s. Um, the Hoffman Circle attempted to frame the operations of the collective drug culture as experiments, attempts, symposia or seances, the best possible results being framed by Ernst Junger, the writer Ernst Junger, as an initiation. Although they did not expect every meeting to result in an initiation, um, they still ritualized them by restricting numbers, adopting exotic or oriental dress, and playing classical music. And they paid attention to set and setting, celebrating the return to reality um, with a fine meal and wine, prepared, of course, by their, their doting wives. It was very patriarchal kind of indulgence in psychedelics. So who were they? Um, amongst them were Rudolf Gelke, um, an iranologist, a drug historian and a psychonaut. Um, here's a couple of his books. Um, this one, von Rausch means drugs in the Orient and Occident. Um, and on the right, that's actually a bootleg copy in German or Dutch, German. Um, of an article that he published originally in a, in a journal called Anteos in 1962, later republished in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs, um, on travels in the universe of the soul, reports on self-experiments with delicid LSD and psilocybin. He was a sort of devotee of Iranian culture, and he eventually felt that these kinds of uh, experiments were very self-indulgent and lacked the kind of um, um, sophistication of Iranian drug culture. Um, amongst the sort of Iranian elite, you know, smoking opium and discussing um, literature and such like. Another one was Erwin uh, 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 Yakel. He was a writer, journalist, and politician. Um, he wrote a book about Paracelsus, his worldview, um, in the words of his works. Paracelsus, of course, was at the University of Basel. And um, this curious book. Um, I won't attempt to um, pronounce the German, that the rune of fate in oracle, dream, and trance, um, a situation in Yeckel's life is reflected in a dream, a sign of the I Ching, uh, and in an LSD session with Ru Rudolf Gelbke, who we just talked about, um, taking some minutes. Here's a couple of the illustrations by an artist called Adi Arznek. Um, this was a kind of specially limited um, edition um, I've got a couple, a couple of copies of these myself, but hard to find, very expensive if you can find. Um, here's another. Hans Wertmuller, writer, poet, bookseller, and bryologist, a student of mosses and liverworts, um, a hobby he took up later in life. Um, he's the father of Lucius Wertmuller, um, who published along with um, Hagenbach, the book Mystic Chemist um, about the life and, and uh, of, of Albert Hoffman and his, um, his discovery of LSD. Um, Wertmuller published this book, The World Process and Color, 
the system of analogies between uh, uh, through colors between cosmic and historical processes, something which Ernst Junger also found particularly fascinating, apparently. And finally, Ernst Junger, war hero, author, conservative revolutionary, uh, psychonaut. Um, and he became very, very close friends with Albert Hoffman, who sought him out soon after the end of the Second World War uh, and was connected with him um, by um, Hans Wertmuller. Um, so Junger's book approaches describing his experiences with drugs and his thoughts about them has just been published in translations, approaches, drugs and altered states um, by an American publishing company. He published a number of his earlier works as well. Um, and also there's this book, Visit to Godenholm by Ernst Junger. And this book is kind of semi-autobiographical and describes um, the initiation of some individuals um, and healing one of those from the trauma of the collapse of Germany and their defeat in the Second World War through a session not explicitly with psychedelics, but um, it makes reference to some uh, events described by Hoffman. So essentially, it was related to Junger's experiences um, with Hoffman in uh, drug experimentation or using drugs in a kind of quasi-mystical or therapeutic kind of, of setting. Ernst Klett was another. He was a publisher. Uh, he published Hoffman, Geltke, Jakob, Wertmuller and Junger. So there was this, a close group of friends and associates, literary friends and associates. Um, so there we go. I'm coming to the end. Bicycle Day, 19th of April, 1943. And I've subtitled this A History Fraught with Unacknowledged Ambiguities and Complexities. And I hope you found some of that interesting and, uh, and appropriate uh, this time when we are essentially celebrating uh, Bicycle Day. So there's a somewhat more difficult history um, behind Bicycle Day than that um, in the romanticized view of that, that event. Um, so thanks for your attention. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alan. That was fascinating. So we've got a, about maybe about 10, possibly 15 minutes for some questions. Um, we have a mic here, so either raise your voice if you're very loud or if you'd like the mic to speak from, because you're more softly spoken, do say, and I'll run it up to you, but otherwise just use your lungs. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, Andy. Andy. Um, you mentioned uh, Lewis Harmon and his theory about it being, you know, some students in the secret society. Mm. Where did he get that information from? I know you said he was a, you know, a friend of some third and all those people, but they never mentioned it. How about it? Well, we just don't know. So, <clears throat> I mean, I, I'm sort of suggesting here that it's maybe a confused account of a knowledge by that West Coast psychedelic elite um, of Gerald Hurd and, and, and Aldous Huxley and so on, who were in contact with, with Hoffman. Well, M Mark Stahlman is interesting. Um, but he claims to have secret inside knowledge and has spoken privately, <clears throat> excuse my voice, spoken privately to, um, to uh, former employees of Sandoz. But, um, but he, he can't reveal his, his sources. But it's kind of interesting that um, that, that emerged prior to this, this Perutz novel, which is an extraordinary novel. I mean, the, the question in my mind, I think the Perutz novel is problematic. Um, because not only does he describe this derivation of, of, a, of a psychoactive drug from ergot, his purpose is to, um, to reinstate the Holy Roman Empire under this, this uh, secret bloodline that he's, that he's found. And um, it has these kind of occult connections as well, which is kind of, in, uh, kind of interesting. And uh, I, th I guess one question you have to ask is, is if, if Perutz could work this out, um, or had knowledge through perhaps occult associates, because after his wife died quite young, he became involved in seances and such like um, um, following his wife's death, understandably. But, but the answer is we don't know. I mean, there are some living individuals 
um, who probably knew Willis Harmon. Well, I think Jim Fadiman is one. So if anyone knows Jim Fadiman, a friend of Jim Fadiman, you might ask him if he knows anything about where Willis Harmon got this from. But he seems like a straight up kind of person. Um, I wouldn't put it past um, um, Captain Tripps, um, the, uh, the Johnny Appleseed of, uh, of LSD, who is... Hubbard. Alfred Hubbard. Yeah, Hubbard, yes. And he was a, probably a teller of tall tales. Um, but Leary refers to an informal wisdom school um, in one of his novels, Around Hoffman. So he had some knowledge, certainly, of what Carl Beyer, Professor Carl Beyer, called a, 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 an occultic circle around, um, a, a, around Hoffman. Um, but no one, to my knowledge, has picked up on Stoll's connection with Hesse, which is quite, quite extraordinary, really, because of the importance of, of Hesse. Stoll was, a, I mean, I kind, kind of admit, I kind of fell in love a bit with Stoll and out of love a bit with Albert Hoffman, but that's just my, my first view, the more I learned about Stoll. Because um, he was this, you know, highly cultured figure. Not to say that Hoffman wasn't necessarily, but a collector of art. He was a patron of the arts, um, and um, and so on. I've lost my thread there a little bit, but but um, but yes, it, yes. The, 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 no one has referred to Stoll's close relationship with Hess. He was also a friend of uh, of Albert Schweitzer, um, and um, so he was quite a, an important figure. Stoll and well, well, well uh, sorry, yes, yes, Arthur Stoll, a uh, uh, well-known figure. Mm. Thanks very much. Next, question, any sorry. other questions? In the front here. Uh, Albert Hoffman, the man who you said who employed him, uh, was working on Ergot for maybe 20 years before LST was discovered. Yes, indeed. So, and Albert Hoffman wrote about local Ergot having the potential with... He wrote, he wrote in um, with that book with Wassum about Ergot having the potential to be... the the secret sacrament of Eleusis. Sorry? That Ergot could have been the source of the, the, the secret dreaming. Yeah, the kick on. The remarkable thing, of course, is that Perutz anticipated that. Do you think they thought that? Do you think, do you think Hoffman's employer um, knew the potential of Ergot potentially back in the 20s and 30s? At the moment, we could only speculate. Um, Mike Jay has looked through probably more than just what he refers to in his in his essay, where he where he questions Hoffman's original account, and that's referred to in my essay. And you can find Mike Jay's. I don't know if Mike Jay's present, but he's going to be at the conference. Um, but um, so I mean, coming back to my original point, you know, if if Perutz could work it out, why not Albert Hoffman? My essay about what I call the mystery of, of Saint Peter's Snow, Leo Perutz and Saint Peter's Snow. Um, I spent a long time seeking out, well, what sources could Perutz have for, for predicting, uh, so to speak, um, both the discovery of LSD or the manufacture of LSD as a, as a kind of um, something that induces a religious experience and as the secret sacrament of, of the ages. Um, sorry, I've lost myself there. But there, yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Holly? Well, <laughs> I think that if Hoffman had been a follower of Steiner, then, um, um, but Steiner, of course, was contemporaneous with these, with these other movements. Ascona, the, 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 the kind of hippie commune at Monte Verita, which was the center of kind of new age culture of the 1920s and 30s. Um, um, sorry, your question again? Just where, where does that conspiracy theory originate? Stein, yes, yeah, well, I'm just saying that Steiner was contemporaneous with those other kinds of groups. And what I am demonstrating here is, well, Hoffman's o own circle um, and then the sort of connection through, through um, Stoll's close friendship with Hesse. Um, so that could have been picked up by his chosen, Harman chose Steinerites, but um, the followers of Steiner, were, it was a contemporary movement to, to places like Monteferri, Ascona and, and those groups, yeah. Any other questions? No? Well, in which case, we're going to do... We have some copies of Alan's wonderful book here. No, you've here. got two questions, I think, there at oh. the back. At least two. Might take a mic up. Go there. for it. Do you want a mic or can you shout? 
I can hear you. I can't actually hear the full question. I can't tell you, I can't hear the full question. Well, so the question is, um, the Willis Harmon was talking about the Steiner connection. Yes. And when and where did he come up with that connection himself? Well, that was, well he, he announced right. it in 1977 in what was a, an Australian news, well, not Australian news, uh, Australian radio show, which was a kind of new age chat show in 1977. And that is the one and only place that I'm aware of that, that Harmon came up with this particular story. Um, the entire radio show is transcribed in a, in a book. The reference is in my, is in my, is, is in my book, in the, in, in the paper. Um, but it appears that, it's, uh, that it was something that, that Harman had from a, a source that he doesn't refer to. Um, and again, it, my suspicion is, um, unless of course it's true, <laughs> that, I mean, if, if Hoffman was a follower of Regal Sign, I think we'd know that. There wouldn't necessarily be any reason to keep that secret. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Lucius um, Wertmuller, the son of Hans Wertmuller, who is a close friend of Hoffman's, um, I think Lucius Wertmuller would have known that and perhaps addressed it in the book Mystic Chemist, which he, which he wrote with Dieter Hagenbach. So uh, I think it's quite doubtful that they really... Well, certainly he claims that, Ho that, that Hoffman was a follower of Steiner, which I don't think was true. Um, but Hoffman had his... Had, one might say, occult mystical inclinations, those that he describes himself and those which are, are bound up with the circle of, um, of friends, particularly Junger, who was, who was um, I think you'd have to read his book, The Adventurous Heart, to get a sense of, of where Ernst Junger, uh, and that was the book that Hoffman refers to that he returned to again and again, uh, The Adventurous Heart. There were several editions, uh, and I can't guarantee that the, the current translation available, it's by the same publishing company who's brought out Junger's book, Approaches, um, that, um, that it's necessarily the one that Hoffman referred to, but he wrote his book in 1978 in German, originally Hoffman, and um, he, he could have chosen to refer to which edition of The Adventurous Heart he, he, he wanted to refer. But I, I would say read The Adventurous Heart uh, um, and you get an idea of, of Junger's, the nature of what you might call Junger's occultism and, and mysticism. I mean, he writes in there about sort of uh, secret sages, you know, hidden in the in the depths of Tibet and, and so on, who are kind of, you know, operating uh, occultly behind the scenes. Um, and I think he has, he has theories about, you know, um, the cycles of history and, and such like, which have an occult dimension, referred to there uh, in connection with, um, um, it was Wertmuller's book, wasn't it, about um, world history and colour and so on. So, yeah. I hope that's sort of answered. Um, but The Adventurous Heart, anyone who's curious about younger, bit more insight into Jung, go read all of his books, but uh, any of them. But uh, it's something completely different from he, what he's famous for, his war experiences. Um, it, 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 it explains the occult dimension to his, to his, his thinking. And I think his, his thinking he had a very deep occult dimension. I'm just going to throw another like, one. Or not? I'm just going to follow up myself with a question to that then. So there seems there's some question that there was um, an occult influence uh, with LSD prior to its discovery, so obviously that's a mute point. Um, what is Jünger's occult influence afterwards for Hoffman? Does he run with that and develop it in any way in his writings about it? Does Jünger? No, does Hoffman from Jünger's influence? No, not really, not, not that I'm aware. It's not something that he, he refers to. I mean, I think Jünger, I mean, Hoffman, I mean, Hoffman's movement was towards this Eleusinian mystery thing, really, wasn't he? So that he, he, he wrote in conjunction with Wasson and, and Karl Ruck. And um, there's at least one essay attributed, at least to, to, to Hoffman, whether he entirely wrote it, in which he's in sort of envisaging uh, a new Eleusis, you know, a new church, so to speak, based around um, LSD or psychoactive substance. So I think his vision was something of that nature. He might have been, I mean, uh, Jünger might have been something of a, of a Mephistopheles to his Faust. Um, they didn't necessarily agree on all things. I mean, I think Jünger's quite a dark figure. If you, if you look at the adventurous heart, there are these sort of pictures of, uh, 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 of people being sacrificed in, in occult <laughs> circumstances and such like. And so quite a dark character which Hoffman didn't necessarily borrow everything everything from. 
Um, were there any other oh, questions at the front here? Oh, yeah, no. Well, well, I've certainly learned a lot. Now I can't resist asking, what about Freud, Jung, and Wilhelm Reich? Well, were they all part of the same gang, the, weren't they? The, the, same time, I, German? I can tell you almost no, nothing about Freud, um, Jung, Wilhelm Reich, but there, there is a connection. Uh, I, I think that, that Jung was a bit evasive when he was asked about his knowledge concerning um, psychoactive drugs. Um, I mean, the, the letters are in the collected letters. If you, if you, if you take a look on it, I think you can find them online. Um, uh, in one, I mean, uh, Hubbard, uh, the notorious Captain Al Hubbard, wrote to Jung, inviting him, I think, to come and probably to come to the States and speak. Um, but um, Jung, as you possibly know, um, was not in favour of psychoactive drugs. He thought that, they, um, that they, they let things out too quickly instead of a slow process of, um, of psychoanalysis. Um, but I think he knew a little bit more. Um, certainly, um, I think there was, uh, he knew Prinzhorn, uh, Hans Prinzhorn, who, the, the man who uh, um, famously uh, collected the art of the, the insane, so to speak, as they were, as they were called then, um, and um, which was a great influence on modernist artists. Uh, but Prinzhorn was, it was an interesting character who was both an art historian um, and a psychiatrist or psychologist. And he was employed by Heidelberg University to collect the, the art of the insane, which was, as it was later published. Um, but he actually um, was involved in the Heidelberg mescaline experiments and had experience of, of LSD, oh, sorry, of mescaline. And um, I think that, you, you, that, that Jung, through Pinshorn, who he definitely knew or had some association with, he probably know rather, knew rather more about mescaline um, than, he, than, he let, than he let on. That's the one connection um, and, um, that, uh, that I'm aware of. So I'm still dig, digging into that a little bit. Um, but there's some prints on correspondence that looks looks interesting if I can uh, maybe get it in translation because unfortunately I don't read German. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? One at the far end here. Hold on, Martin. Let me give you the microphone so everyone can hear. We know that the Merck Corporation d developed MDMA in 1912. We also know that they had other methamphetamine type groups. I was just curious if anyone knows, did Sasha go looking in that archive? Given what he then went into and, and how widespread... So you're talking about Sasha Shulgin? Yeah, but how widespread was the knowledge of that, of the, the, the you know, phenethylamines that they developed? Because That's you know, not my area at all, unfortunately. But it's, you know, um, I mean, Spath developed... You know, it's, it's, we've got other analogues of mescaline, sort of, within, mm. that, within, within Sasha's work. Oh. I've got the inside gen, no worries. Okay, okay. Of course, uh, Hoffman at first, when he, when he was first um, uh, intoxicated by LSD, he thought it might have been an amphetamine, as a matter of fact. He thought it might be, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? Was there one right at the back? Hand up high if there was? No? Can I, can I just then say thank you? Yeah, of course. To everybody of, uh, 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 of listening to me and what I had to say. This was important for me, it's kind of a visual representation, uh, particularly these figures, this is kind of um, a pedagogical succession behind um, the discovery of LSD and those kinds of things. Um, and um, there's a lot more detail, obviously, in my essay on bicycle day. And it's not only, as I said, I think at the beginning, bicycle day is just one essay uh, among seven, is it? Um, examining the sort of partly, you might say, the secret history of, um, of psychoactive drugs kind of concealed in, um, for example, a kind of sapphic novel and, um, and, a, and a science fiction novel of the 1920s. That's, that's an area that particularly interests me. But thank you, everybody who's attended. I hope it's been of interest. Thank you. <laughs>